biggest challenges on work is we are now facing the fact that people have got longer working lives. They are possibly not coming into work as early as they used to. They're coming in in their early 20s rather than in their teens, but they are staying on. So everyone now is looking at potentially 50 years of working life. And we still haven't managed to get to grips with this. We still got people working up to the limit of their capability and then sitting in jobs. We've got people trying to climb the greasy pole until they're virtually dead of senility, instead of actually finding a way in which people can work to a particular level and then actually decrease the amount of work and decrease the salary you get. That is a much bigger social enterprise we have to confront. And within that, we've got to deal with the inequality of capital access. If you're a white-led business in London, you have access on first stream capital of about 250,000 pounds on average. If you're a black-led business, that access to capital is 25,000 pounds, if you're lucky. And that is just absolutely outrageous. If we're talking about what really damages business in this city, it's the inequality of access to capital and wealth for people who just have to have a different colour skin. One of the big, most damaging things in this city, if you go to law mayor's banquets or you go to the House of Lords, there are more big black people serving at tables than sitting on the red benches of the House of Lords. That is an outrage. That doesn't actually represent our city. These are the important things. So let's spend less time worrying about the things we can't change and more time worrying about the things we should, each of us can change. And finally, I'm not worried about national debt. It's less than 100% of GDP. 90% of it's with the Bank of England. They're hardly gonna turn up at the Treasury and start taking the furniture out, are they? <laughs> the Japanese have had a debt of 200% or more of GDP for the last 20 years. So, I'm not worried. <laughs> who, who, would have, who would have thought that we'd get onto those uh, kind of topics? <laughs> um, uh, uh, there, there is probably quite a lot to discuss, and, and, and Alex is, going, is itching to, to, right. to respond to that. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, if, if I can say, even on the panel, of course, there's a divergence of opinion, and we do not want you, as stakeholders in London, um, to be an echo chamber for what we say here. We want you to ask questions. We want you to provoke and to stimulate discussion and to help um, as thought leaders of the future to, um, to encourage what we need London to be. You've heard one element of, of it um, to my left. You'll probably hear other elements to my right. My own thoughts are, um, and these are just repeated thoughts, not necessarily personal thoughts, but there, are, there, are, there, are, there is a discussion point that's aired in, in, in public discourse that what do we do as employers? Do we, do we, you know, we now have our table football, we have our, you know, we have, have our, our table tennis and our, and our bowling um, alley in order to encourage, you know, our people to come to work, you know, since when has work become a fairground um, for, for the, our employer, employees to determine when they can? Actually, it's a question of, in my business in hospitality, it's what, what public demands, and we have to swivel to public demand. When, 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 it, when people were being encouraged not to come to workplace, of course that, that was inconsistent with um, you can open up your spa and do a massage um, on who one might ask because of course the people that did the clientele weren't there. But you, there were workers who were working in spas and hairdressers and serving teas and coffees and providing services to key workers and so on, who were working as were people in the National Health Service and, and logistics and so on, whilst others were being discouraged from going to their workplaces. These inconsistencies are many. Uh, they can cause fury and anger and irritation for those people who have lost their livelihoods and indeed even lives as a result of a complacent attitude and a response to a pandemic. And that's really where we are. We're in a situation where we are responding to. There's the pandemic itself and there's the, the government and other people's response to it. As to shaping the government's views, there's limits to what we can do, but we can certainly make noises in the right direction so that they listen to us and we can amplify the voices of many. But actually, we as the people, the us and the we, and the together that we have heard uh, on the panel and from uh, the floor so far when we talk about we, we can influence and shape the future because there is a vacuum. And I'm not sure it's central government. I'm not sure it's the mayor's office. I'm not sure it's the local boroughs. Um, I'm not sure who it is. But frankly, um, the reason why we existed in the first place was because there was a vacuum quota. And I, I think that vacuum still exists. So we now need to be part of the discussion ongoing uh, in order to try and, and, and shape the future for London because we are all interrelated, interconnected and dependent on each other for it, whether we're an employer, an employee, whether we provide 
services and transport or whatever we do, actually we are all interrelated and interdependent. And if we do want to um, uh, uh, encourage a lifestyle for ourselves, whether we live and work in central London or elsewhere, we are still dependent on others. Um, over to you, Alex, and then to Claire. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm not, I mean, just to deal with Richard's point specifically about telling companies what to do, first of all, I'm not saying that. I, I'm saying that companies should be making informed choices about the consequences of making lasting decisions which they may then come to regret. And that's the first thing. I just think that a lot of decisions are being made without a full understanding of the impact. The second thing is, I mean, whether we like it or not, Richard, the government has always influenced companies and how they operate through taxes, through legislation, Investment. I mean, as I say, the government collectively, we decided collectively to build Crossrail, right? Big public project, tens of billions of pounds, because we wanted to encourage people to come into the centre of London because it was good for the economy. So the government's always had policy levers and created incentives. Company car taxation was phased out because we wanted to change the way people uh, got to work and all the rest of it. So there's, you can't, you know, we can't think of government and government policy signalling as being in isolation of how individual companies make decisions and indeed uh, choices. The second thing I think, there's an intergenerational impact here. I mean, you, you know, I'm not particularly worried about national debt because I won't be paying it, right, the way things are going. You might not be, but this is, you know, what at some point it needs to be paid back. And as Baroness Fox has said, there are three ways of dealing with it. Well, because when, that's, when how, the real economy work, that's how the real economy <laughs> works. You know, there are three ways of dealing with it. One is through inflation, the other is through cuts, uh, and the third is through growth. And inflation has huge in inequality and in intergenerational impacts amongst many of the groups that you were talking about. And in some ways, growth is the most fair and equitable and productive way of dealing with some of these structural impacts uh, that we found ourselves uh, with. And to be honest with you, I don't think Japan is a particularly good example of a country which has been saddled with huge debt. Uh, its economy has performed very sluggishly in the last 20 years, and there's a huge amount of um, challenge and, and with productivity and, and sort of social disquiet over there, which you know is probably subject for another day. I mean, the final thing I just say on this, on the, on the question originally around aviation and so forth. I mean, the risk is, and this is a risk rather than a reality. The risk is that we've kind of got the government by focus group at the moment. Yeah. So there's an obsession with what people in one part of the yeah. country think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I have to tell you that those people who will be older and will vote, so they actually vote, they're more socially conservative, they don't actually travel very often, if at all. And there's a great poll in The Economist this week which showed around 20 to 30% of people believe that COVID restrictions should exist once COVID has disappeared. So around 30% of people believe there should be a 10 p.m. curfew, right? Thank you for picking that. Around 20% of people believe nightclubs and casinos should be shut into perpetuity, all right? And they're very, you know, these people at the moment, uh, in terms of their influence on policy, is probably too much. And, you know, aviation is one of those sectors that we actually did rather well in Britain. Um, we have the safest, the most productive, some of the best airlines in the UK. And it's just remarkable to watch how that sector has effectively been abandoned by the government. And I have a nasty feeling it's a combination of responding to focus group policy, policy by focus group, and it's kind of seen as a way of dealing with this environmental issue, which of course is very close to the Prime Minister's heart. The problem is, of course, that people will not fly with British registered carriers, but they'll continue to fly, but they'll just fly with carriers from other parts of the world, right? So which is why we need proper policies around taxing carbon and international agreements points that have already been made in order to tackle things like that. So I think we should, I think we should, you know, at one level central London might be okay in all of this, right? You know, but all these companies downsize their footprints, what that will do is create more space for other companies to move in. <coughs> and where will those companies come from? They'll come from all the parts of the country the government claims it is preoccupied with in this levelling up agenda. So at one level, we could just let this thing rip, right? As central London stakeholders, we could shrug our shoulders and say it will be okay. I just think that's a kind of reckless and rather short-sighted and, and, and 
not very sophisticated way of trying to navigate through what has become the biggest challenge to central London in its economy since the Second World War. Which I think is why it's important we have these debates and, and, and think through the sort of London we want to see, rather than just saying, let's leave it up to everybody to make decisions without really understanding the consequences of those decisions. And that's exactly why we're here. We need to think through the kind of London we want to, we want it to be. And then we want to try and shape and frame it. Um, over to you, um, Aaron. Just a couple of things on the work point. Because I think you can say to people, what kind of atmosphere do you want to work in? And I started off by two things. If you say to people, do you want to go to work? I mean, I used to be a teacher. Most young people don't want to work. I mean, they'd rather have enough money to never work, if, if you know what I mean, right? So what, what I'm trying to say is that you can say, would you prefer to work from home? And a lot of people think, yeah, I prefer to work from home, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do, even for them. Because actually, young people can't learn the job from their Zoom computer. If you think about passing on, in, um, it's, you know, training is not just a kind of doing some training course with the skills you know, a qualification at the end. It's actually being on the job and learning on the job. So that, that gets lost. There's the networking, there's the learning how to communicate with people, the learning how to deal with the office bully, the learning how to, uh, you know, do deals, the, the conversations that happen in between the formal meetings, all of these things. This, this row wouldn't have happened on Zoom, right? Because in a way, that's not what happens. It kind of takes the life out of everything. You can't see the tensions, you can't look in the eyes of people, you can't, and so on. But that's what life is like, right? But if you say to people, and so that's one thing. The other thing is I started off by saying people had had the stuffing knocked out of them. Pe people have retreated, so they're a bit fearful. They don't really want to go back into that, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't. And actually, when you do take the risk, like as everything else, it's worth it. That's one thing. The other thing is, what kind of work are we talking about? I'm not about imposing it. I said give a lead. I think companies should give a lead and encourage and suggest that the best thing to do is to get back to normal. And I'll tell you, let's think about what uh, working from home hybrid would be like if it was uh, done by lecturers. It would mean, as they've just had, students for another many years actually not being taught at university at all, but getting these stupid hybrid lectures. or you know, uh, That's not a university experience. But of course, a lot of the lecturers don't want to go back. A lot of the, le well, the lecture with the union doesn't want them to go back. They're saying, oh no, students really like it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It suits them, right, to sort of do their lecture, but it's actually terrible. Um, what about nurses and doctors? Well, nurses won't, but a lot of doctors aren't opening up their GP surgeries. And in the House of Lords, the health minister keeps saying, well, isn't it marvellous that we can do health via, you know, digital? And it's like, no, I want to go to the doctor. I don't want an appointment via Zoom, right? Never mind the people who might worry that their parents have got dementia and need a memory test, and you're told to do it by phone or digital consultation. These things are a lesser service. And I, I mentioned, but I just think it's important, hundreds of thousands, millions of people have worked full time throughout this pandemic. They're called working class people. And if London wants to get anywhere, to talk about the, to basically talk about a, an economy that's dependent on them serving us so that we can have a hybrid work economy because of the needs of some people, strikes me as being the greatest, grossest elitist attitude that you can have. And I think that we should all work together to get work back to normal. Now then, I do not think that bosses should say, I will sack you if you want to have you know, some kind of flexibility. Absolutely. That's different. But what we're doing is making a virtue out of a necessity. And I object to that. I want to go back to normal, and then we can say, well, did we learn anything positive? Let's talk about it. But this is making it a fait accompli. And I, and I don't think it's going to be positive for society to do that in general myself. Thank you, Claire. OK, I'm going to just sort of sum up to give you some, some, some thoughts um, to ask questions and to be provocative in, um, after we've had a, a, a cup of tea or coffee. Okay, so these are just summing up in no particular order. Um, we, we heard about the existing inequalities. Uh, poverty, transport, pollution, and housing were, were um, discussed as part of the, the consideration for leveling up. We just heard about who's taking leadership, uh, and we've, taken, we've, we've heard about um, whether it suits
me, suits them, suits us. Um, we've heard about threats, the existential threat, particularly arts and culture and their representatives in arts and culture here. Um, that in fact, the, in, with, in, with foresight and ambition, the Corporation of City of London, as I said, of uh, brand partners of CLA, have a, a culture and commerce task force. They see culture and commerce as being intrinsically linked to each other, that actually people don't come back to work at their desk. Actually, they come back for a whole range of reasons. And in fact, I'm not sure that working two or three days um, and, and perhaps spending the night even in a hotel to make use of, um, of dwell time um, post your work is in fact the right model. Uh, I, I think that going back to Claire's view of the old norm or the, whatever the, the norm it was, um, and, and remember the norm never stays um, the norm for very long. It's a constantly shifting change and pattern and it always has been. Um, so we, we, we heard about that. We, we heard about the uh, uh, sustainability in different forms, environmental and, and finance, and whether it's, uh, whether current debt is, um, is sustainable or unsustainable, whether, whether or not the way in which we uh, Los Angeles, London, and transport um, is, a, is a way forward, and whether it has um, a consequential impacts that we perhaps haven't foreseen. But I, I can say anecdotally that I have stayed in the Ritz-Carlton when it existed in Pasadena and, and overlooked Los Angeles and seen just the smog of Los Angeles because everybody just drives in and drives out and they're just stuck. Um, and that isn't actually going to be very sustainable. And if we, you know, whether it be on the M4 to Wiltshire um, or on the M1 to you know, wherever it is, Moore Park, I'm not sure that that's actually going to be very sensible as to the future. The one word that I want to, um, uh, to re-emphasize is together, uh, along with responsibility. Both of those words were mentioned, I, tell, I highlight those. Um, uh, we talked about jobs and local skills and the workforce uh, and the relationship with, um, on a micro level, with, um, uh, with employee and employer, with businesses with each other, with businesses and local authority, and then we even looked at the relationship with Europe and whether or not we've actually been thinking about a mature and sensible, proactive um, a way of dealing with the world, including uh, with our biggest trading partner, Europe. Um, um, we, we, we heard from Claire that, um, that leadership encourages the normal. Um, we, we talked about, um, or, or we heard about remotivating sociability, um, uh, the, the uh, proportionate um, um, response to challenges, because that has to happen. There are challenges that we um, have faced in the past, 2007 8, and the financial credit crunch. Um, we've had all kinds of challenges, bombs going off in the tube not far from here in Allgate. Uh, there's always been challenges, but the response to it has normally been proportional. And I can speak anecdotally from from uh, from seven seven when bombs were going off, and I set up a triage centre in one of our hotels, and we accommodated everybody. We turned the spa and the, and the health club into you know, just got, bought every sleeping bag. I sent people out to go buy sleeping bags when nobody else was flooding out of out of London, saying what on earth the world's coming to an end. Uh, but actually, London bounced straight back. And actually, people came straight back to work, and they weren't going to be bowed and cowed as a result of those kind of activities. Uh, London is resilient, and, and as Claire said, celebrating risk is important. Um, and that's in economic terms, it's in social terms. We shouldn't be frightened. Um, we need to do more than just simply let's see um, as to what happens, uh, and, and just rely on polling and focus group to determine our futures and the futures of our children and our workforce. Uh, and our businesses. Um, we, us, together, three words I want to have used, um, can decide on how we shape uh, and view the future of London. 